So, Pell, planning and environmental linkages. This term has been around for about 10 years now. Uh, kind of came to fruition, came in vogue after about safety loo was passed. So many of you may know what it is, many of you may think you know what it is, so I was going to read what the definition is according to the Federal Highway Administration. It is, a pro it is an approach, and I want to emphasize it's an approach, not a process, to transportation decision making that considers environmental, community, and economic goals early in the project stage and carries them through the project development, design, and construction. So I really want to emphasize it's really an approach. You might even want to think it should be a philosophy. It is not a process. And it may sound hard. It may sound something like it's an additional duty, but it's really not. And it does take some effort, but it doesn't have to be hard. So since about 2007, when the rules actually came out after Pell and some definitions were evolved, um, COG really went full force into this and saw this as something very beneficial to because we were seeing a very big disconnect between what the plan was showing, the regional plan, and what was happening in NEPA and some of the designs. So we have I'm going to highlight four of our efforts and then talk a little bit about some of our previous efforts. So the first one is our regional ecosystem framework or REF. Have any of y'all heard about ecological? Okay, you yeah, have, yes, thank you very much, Carlos. At least you should be. Uh, <laughs> this is something that started as part of that effort, too. So um, back in 2007, we got several grants. We got actually one grant from FHWA and another one from TRB to develop the REF, and I'm going to call it the REF. And the first iteration we finished was completed in 2011. And what it is, is it's a GIS, GIS tool that we are developing to identify, assess, and look at environmental impacts at the beginning to help avoid them. Oh, and by the way, then take credit for it. One of the good things that we really do do, I think, well, is we do avoid and minimize impacts. I don't think we necessarily take a lot of credit for that in our environmental documents and in our environmental processes. This is a process that can help you out with that. This was developed, this database was developed working with state and federal agencies as well as non-governmental um, non conservation organizations that are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And basically we've got 10 different information layers we're putting in here. We've got a green infrastructure layer, we've got water considerations, and then we've also got a value section. And on here I have a list of all the 10 layers. Just to briefly show, these are the data sources. Again, some of them are COG, some of them are USGS, uh, USGS, EPA. We are not developing new data. We're just combining a whole bunch of data. The one thing I do want to bring up on the, uh, the REAP layer is what's interesting about that is that really helps bring a different value to the system because it talks about rarity, diversity, and sustainability, not just quantities which I think is very, very interesting. Again, we've just recently completed an update to all of our data, and this is what the information layers look like. And what we do is we assign a score to them, basically from one to five. The higher scores is also do the darker colors. And where that gets us is those are, you got a higher probability of that type of resource occurring in these areas and probably more investigation is needed. And so we've got 10 layers, so we're getting data together for you. What's really great about this is again by the fact that we've involved the resource agencies in developing this information, we're going to have one consistent source of information that y'all can use. So this is what, and then we've combined it into a composition layer. So you can see, and it's very intuitive, where are the areas that are more natural, the darker areas. You can see kind of our core areas are kind of lighter colored is because we pretty much built over everything. Uh, but that's kind of what you expect to see in the map. And this can help you when you're starting to do your planning on your projects. The other thing is, too, is we feel that the REF can also be a foundation for um, 
conservation and for mitigation. And maybe even looking at what we're proposing is that mitigation should be looking at a watershed uh, level, especially when it comes to biological resources. And this is one of our maps that we've just recently produced, and it basically talks about mitigation opportunity sites and priorities to enhance and to um, at the watershed level. And we think this is something that would be very beneficial for TxDOT and others to use when you're talking about indirect and cumulative impacts, you can put it in a regional context. And um, I want to emphasize too, if many of you have noticed is these maps look kind of small. We're pulling this together, this data together for 12 counties. Um, COG as the MPO is the second largest metropolitan planning organization in the nation. We cover 9,441 miles. So it's a lot of effort to put all this together. But I think it's very interesting so you can really highlight what is important in our region. And it's coming from a regional source. So what we're really hoping to accomplish with this is really to strengthen the relationships with our partner resource agencies. Again, they are involved in this process and they actually like to see so that somebody who maybe is only interested in wetlands can see how it is in context with uh, agricultural lands, with the watershed, with other biological resources in our community. We think it's a great tool that be, can be done at a pre-NEPA analysis. Uh, the gentleman earlier, I believe it was Mike, was talking about uh, doing scoping. Here's your scoping data. It's got pretty much everything you need to know. So we're hoping that we actually did a um, TxDOT, Dallas District, did a Loop 9 feasibility study a couple of years ago. And we then took, the, and we had participated in that, and they did it the tr traditional way, going to individual database sources and pulling information for what they knew. We then, as part of our analysis on the REF to say, how really good is it going to be? We then took, and we took their alignment, and we overlaid it with our data and tried to see, was there any correlation? Did we have similar results? And what we found was, in some areas we had similar results, in some areas we didn't, but the results that were coming out of the REF and overlaying the alignment on the RF data, we actually, it was more intuitive of what we really thought was out there. And it also wasn't just based on a quantity, it was based on a quality. So you could say, well, it's got, you know, two miles of stream that are going to be potentially impacted. Yes, but what is the quality of it? This is what you can get from this information. And we think it could be very helpful and supportive, again, of your pre-NEPA uh, and even scoping process. Well, one of the things, though, I've been talking about this is great information. How are you going to get access to it? Well, that is one thing we are getting ready to roll out by the end of the year is our REF website so that you will be able to put your, proce your project in there and then see what the values are. What's interesting is that the REF has, and I've seen, I've, I've got the beta test, it's really neat. Not only does it have our 10 layers that we've put together, but we've added a parks layer, historical properties and districts, potential archeological liability sites, landfills, mitigation banks, conservation easements, and land use. Pretty much almost everything you would need. And again, we roll it up to a regional level so you can see how your corridor scores or is valued against other corridors or other parts of the region. Another way we are using this information is we are integrating this into our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. Okay, Metropolitan Transportation Plan is your 20-year plan for what improvements are going to be built, not only in highways, but uh, transit, um, bicycle, pedestrian, other things within the region. If you're not familiar with your plan, make sure you know about it. Uh, we are including this data in here in two locations. One, we actually have a scoring. Uh, this is a potential project that could go into our Mobility 2040 plan. And then here's a fact sheet from our current uh, mobility plan. If you see where the circle is, where we have put the values in there and we have also put the mapping in there to kind of get some context to the corridor. These fact sheets are very, um, 
beneficial to our elected officials and to the public uh, because it puts everything in one particular place. Talk about land use, employment, uh, map, uh, and even a map of the corridor. So we think it's some, a great communication tool. Now, one of the things I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks is that Pell is part, you know, part of it is the decision-making process, but you need to account for uh, the goals of your community, whether they be environmental, uh, quality of life, et cetera. The mobility plan is where you can get those. If you ever struggle as to what are the plans or the goals of your community, comprehensive plans are one thing, but for a transportation, that's what the MTP is. We have very strong goals, and they only not only relate to mobility, the mobility of not only people, but of goods, quality of life, is sustainability. Sustainability is one of our large uh, efforts, too, is sustainable communities, sustainable environment. Another big part of what we do and another big effort is our congestion mitigation plan or excuse me, uh, congestion management process, pardon me, get all these acronyms mixed up. There's so many of them now. So if you are in an area of more than 200,000 people and you're in non-attainment, you're required by the federal government to have a CMP. That is usually done at the MPO level. And that's basically what our charge is. And we have this lovely, lovely long process. And we recently updated our process, and I wanna say it was 2013. And in the past, it, the CMP has kind of evolved over time where it was a very large part of the document. Then it got put at the MPO level. We did the analysis and uh, basically a paragraph was put into your environmental document. Not anymore, <laughs> at least not in Dallas-Fort Worth. So what we have developed is an iterative process of it's the projects in the plan, during your environmental process, you should complete a CMP, turn it back to us at COG, and then we put whatever has come out of that CMP into the plan for the next time. So it's an iterative process because it just doesn't go in a drawer. So you can see where there's a little flow chart there. It's kind of complicated and stuff like that. So. <laughs> We think that this is a great way also, again, going towards the NEPA process, that you can help identify your need and purpose from information that we've already put together. So for every major freeway corridor or toll road corridor, anything controlled access in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we have evaluated it based on the roadway infrastructure, mobility options, system demand, and system reliability. This is where we're trying to figure out what projects need really the most help, which ones need to be built, which ones need improvement now, and what is the best way to do that, taking all of these factors into consideration. Because unless you're in a region that has a ton of money, we don't have a ton of money. Well, we do have a lot of money. We just don't have enough money. Nobody ever does. We have to prioritize projects. Which are the ones that float to the top that need the most help now, and which, where do they need the help? This is a process that helps us determine that. Again, though, it is something that can help you in the NEPA process, in the environmental process. And again, I think it's also easier for you when you're writing an environmental document to say it came from a regional plan, it came from a regional document. You know, there's some weight behind that. So just to let you know, and you're not gonna be able to read this, this is just one of the shots. So we have again evaluated all the corridors in the region for this, and this is available online. These are the corridors that right now, based on our CMP, the composite scores of those four categories need the most improvements now from a congestion perspective. And if you look at it, it's pretty intuitive. Yeah, that's pretty much where it is. These are the worst of the worst corridors. We have developed an Excel spreadsheet uh, that kind of steps you through the process. We have been out to the Dallas district and we've done training. Prior to that, we've done some other training for consultants. Uh, we'd be happy to do it again. Uh, again, we are expecting these forms to be turned back into us and they're going to be needed for, and we are also asking that uh, the information be included in the environmental document as an appendix 
to show this process and so also to, to again make it a transparent process so and I have the website down there if you're very interested and people go oh gosh it's a long lengthy process not if you've done your homework and not if you have uh, most of this information when we talk about population employment within the region you need that for your environmental document anyway so we're just kind of adding a little bit of effort but we think it will be so beneficial to the whole process one of the efforts we started last year is a Pell work group and I appreciate Dan Dan's here and he's a member of that work group and what we do is on a quarterly basis we have a meeting at COG uh, we have let's see the Dallas district attends Fort Worth the district attends uh, FHWA sometimes calls in and also the North Texas Tollway Authority and basically we have a running list of all of the projects that are going to be environmentally cleared substantial projects they're going to be environmentally cleared in the next two years and what we do is we sit down again quarterly how's the project proceeding is it on target is it on schedule is it then we make sure is it consistent with the plan because if it's not consistent with the plan it's probably not consistent with conformity which means it's not going to get environmentally approved doesn't need a tip amendment transportation improvement program I think most of y'all know that so is it all consistent are we ready to move forward uh, you know in our region some of our projects because of the volumes on the roadways needs uh, MSAT analysis COG is the one who does that MSAT analysis for the districts we need to know does the project need that when is it being queued up so we can get that done environmental justice origin and destination we need to know that so again we can get that information in a timely manner to the districts so that they can meet their schedules we also talk about issues like the upcoming metropolitan um, plan when do they have to have information into us so that we can make sure we've got the coding correct when we are going to have conformity what's our schedule for that and then we also talk about training needs so there's a whole plethora of things that we can just sit down and talk about again on a regular basis to make sure that we don't have a hiccup when the project is going to environmental affairs in fact one of the things that we've requested is that um, on the conformity documentation the technical memorandums is that to help to get those through environmental affairs is maybe they get sent to us and we can sign off on it and say it's consistent with the plan to try to help out and identify things and do what we need to do to get those things done earlier again that's what part of the Pell group is and I think it's been very successful and it's always nice when I get an email from uh, either Dan or Jamie uh, from either one of the districts that said something's environmentally clear because I can then go into the list and check it off and it's always great when we can do that and then I want to talk about just real briefly to wrap up a couple of our other Pell efforts so I talked about that we meet uh, that we've gotten um, members from resource agencies uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife US Fish and uh, Wildlife uh, other people to come into our office to help us put together the REF well we also have another time is sometimes um, just to keep them up to date on like for the mobility plan we've started the mobility plan we have two or three um, policies within our environmental plan dealing with the environment and environmental sustainability we have called them in we've briefed them on the new plan we've asked we've shown them what our policy um, policy statements are and asked them for input on those and so we try to at least meet with them once a year to give them a status of what we're doing uh, what other departments within COG are doing uh, to really keep them engaged and to get their input and get their input early early in the process and I know that's sometimes hard to do but so that's a, a group that's been going on for about I want to say about seven or eight years the second one on here is loop nine so many many years ago I want to say we finished it up in about 2011 uh, COG actually did a Pell study um, using this new approach on a outer loop uh, now this would be what you might want to consider if you're familiar with Dallas Fort Worth the outer 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 loop because this thing was about I want to say it was three or four hundred miles long it was huge and uh, basically there had been a concept out there for many years that we needed an outer loop and we needed to start planning it well 
rather than just do a feasibility study, we put the Pell approach to it. Um, we looked at a lot of um, factors, um, both um, built and natural environment factors, and we ran traffic modeling. We looked at a lot of different corridor alignments. We ended up saying that probably the vast majority of it is really not needed. And then we were able to remove it from the plan. This project had been carried in our plan for a number of years. Segments of it are needed. We also used the Pell checklist that was established by FHWA Colorado to make sure that our report was modeled after that to answer all of those questions. And our hope is, is that as projects from the Outer Loop that we did recommend should be f studied further, that that information in that Pell study, which by the way is 3,000 pages long, can be carried forward into the next phase of development and you won't have to go back and reinvent the wheel for the next people or generation that comes behind us. In fact, one of the biggest components of it is we held probably 100 meetings with local officials uh, and communities on this particular project. We have a table at the back of this, it's one of the appendices, that is documents every single comment we got and and we're hoping that you know we, we tried to categorize it whether it was an alignment of comment uh, alignment comment or a right-of-way comment or a natural resources comment so that it could be carried forward so that the next people who want to study this can bring that up and say yes we knew that was a concern yes we remember that because how many times have you gone into a corridor you did some studies the corridor it, it nothing happens for a while and then you restart the process and you restart the public involvement and people say gosh I already made this comment you didn't change anything it happened okay that's why we want to document we wanted to document it so I think it's a very interesting study um, again if you're interested there's the website one of the other aspects we do to try to help support our two districts is our regional tolling analysis. Uh, we have a lot of toll roads proposed for the area. Previously, when FHWA was requiring this in every environmental document, it was turning about to be about a 30, 40, 50 page effort in every single environmental document. And every consultant was doing it slightly different and everyone was having slightly different results of if you start tolling a lot of things, how does it affect the low income and environmental justice populations in the area because it's a cumulative impact yeah. basically if they've got I mean we've got several hundred miles of toll roads proposed and we've started opening them up how's that going to affect people so what we did was is this is something that should probably be done at a regional analysis and we did it at the metropolitan planning organization so we now hold that document we have made it a technical mem memorandum and then we have a four-page summary that goes into every environmental document in the dallas fort worth area that has a priced facility and that way it's consistent so we'll be having to and we redo these rtas every time we have a new plan that will reestablish this so that's kind of also what we're trying to do and get to that. That helps streamline the document. We just basically pulled 40, 50 pages out of every single environmental document that had a priced facility and we put it in a technical memorandum. So I think that's a very much of a benefit. And again, TxDOT doesn't have to worry about that. And I'm sorry for you consultants because I was one at one time paying you to do that again. So again, consistency from our particular region. So before I close, there's one other thing I was going to mention of, if any of you are in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, probably in April of next year, I'm working right now with the Federal Highway Administration to get a Pell workshop, in, um, probably going to be hosted at COG sometime in April. Uh, so if you want more information about Pell and things that are going on not only in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but in across the state and across um, the, the nation, FHWA will th be there teaching that class. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to know somebody else is reading that. 